<laughs> All right. Holy moly. Did we get it to work? Right. Yeah, this is this is awesome. No, First and foremost, no, let me say thank you. No worries. You. I wanna I wanna take a minute out to bust one of my friend's balls. Hey Chris, guess who played in Metallica the other night? Lars and not you. <laughs> <laughs> I saw I saw one of my buddies in the UK scrolling by and in the and the people who joined is one of my one of my friends I like to bust his balls every time I can with any kind of Lars Ulrich joke. Okay, okay. And now is, is he the one who's always requesting – is it Fade to Black? <laughs> What's that? Is he the one who's always requesting the same, the same Metallica song on your Twitch streams? No, he would, he would, he would just request any, any Metallica song. Usually he would, <laughs> he, would, he, would, he would usually request Blacken because he knows I hate playing that song because I never really <laughs> learned it correctly. And I'm like one of those guys that doesn't like to play a cover song unless I know it right. And he's like, oh, come on, I just – Actually, I just tipped you to play it today. I'm like, oh, you son of a bitch. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, 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 guys, things. now I have to. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, <laughs> right. that is my now defunct twi Twitch channel. We can get to that later. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. No, I, I, look, you know, first and foremost, like I say, let me say uh, thank you for taking the time today. This is awesome. I really appreciate it. I'm sure. excited to, to dig into some, some of this stuff. Here on Grown On You Live, you know, I have one introduction question, then the remainder of the interview is about you and your craft, your interest in music, and I have one finale. So starting off with the introduction, let me ask you, as far as, you know, somewhere local to you or maybe even like upstate New York, what's a local eatery or food staple that you would say <laughs> that I would have to try coming through? What's a local restaurant oh. that's a favorite of yours? Oh, oh, God. You know what? This is this is kind of ironic because my wife and I are down a Gordon Ramsay rabbit hole lately. So, like, everything has been, like, Hell's Kitchen, Master Chef, Kitchen Nightmares, any of that shit, you know? So, like, we've been getting <laughs> okay. kicked out of Kitchen Nightmares and all the, you know, restaurants he's been going to, or he goes to and, you know, absolutely upends and everything else. Um Mm -hmm. We have a lot of, we've got a lot of good Italian food up here, um, but it's really hard to pick one eatery because there's just like, there's like one place that has great pasta, but then there's one place that's got great pizza or one place that's got great appetizers or whatever. But, there, you know, there's really, sure. there's not, there's never a, a, a lack of good Italian food in upstate New York, uh, especially where I live. Um the one restaurant I would say would be a go-to would be Ferraris. There's a few. There's a few places. Uh, oh, yeah. Ferraris would be a would it be an Italian restaurant. I would I would tell people to go if you're looking for uh, those people who want that traditional Philly steak sandwich should go to downtown Schenectady and go to Moretz. Downtown Schenectady is where I grew up, and we have a lot of great like you know mom and pop eateries still that are still kind of still sort of sort of alive. Believe it or not, with you know. The advent of, you know, the chain the restaurant and everything else that comes to town and closes all the mom and pop things. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you know, God. Yeah. Yeah. You know, for, 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 for that kind of food there, if you want Mexican food, there's a great place that's up in upper, uh, it's actually the Goose Hill area where my grandparents used to live years ago. Um, and oh, this okay. place, place called The Point, and it's a it's a it's a Mexican place, but it's got great breakfast too. They're like one of those restaurants that has like, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner all day, every all day, all all day, all night, whatever. And they have a really vast menu, even though it's it's centrally a Mexican restaurant. Um, but they mm. got a lot of a lot of good different food on the menu too. So if you're not even in the mood for you know Mexican food per se, you can still get a great burger, or, you know, whatever kind of you know thing that you're thinking. <laughs> Nice. Okay. I mean, it's always nice to have those things on hand too and not have it be like an Applebee's or some big chain shit, you know, where it's like something still, you know, more local and, uh, you know, and, I, and, and still doing the shit right. Please don't even mention Applebee's right now because I'm, I, <laughs> I'm so sick and tired of hearing that fucking commercial on TV with their goddamn <laughs> bourbon skirt steak and date night. I'm like, first of all, who the fuck takes someone to Applebee's for a date in the first place? I'm like, you know, and it's like, and the music's like this half white trash, half country kind of stupid song, and I'm like, wow, this is pertaining to all the third shift workers across the Amer across America right now. Oh, date night, yeah. take my girl to Applebee's and get a steak. No, no. Uh, God. Oh, God. God. It's I on like that. every two that. minutes. It's on, on like every two minutes. My wife and I just grab the remote immediately. Mute, 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 mute. Oh, <laughs> get rid of this fucking uh, commercial. 
My lord, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I think for for better or worse, maybe they're drawing some people from people just hating that song. But uh, God damn it, yeah, we'll uh, we'll move on from there. I appreciate that. Uh, let, let's dig in a little bit as far as you know, growing up and 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 being a young man. Maybe even earlier memories of of being introduced to music and songs, bands, or albums that resonated with you. Uh, you know, maybe even possibly introducing your interest in music. A lot. If you want to talk about like just like albums alone, like album covers alone, for Christ's sakes, yeah. Who's, who's next? Just because, because as a well, as a five year old in 1975, I I found it quite funny that <laughs> in a Beavis and Butthead type way that these guys were <laughs> peeing on the wall. <laughs> I, thought was, I thought that was pretty funny as a five-year-old. I'm like, ah, they're peeing on the wall. Ah, great. <laughs> uh, little did I know how great the album was, just as a five-year-old with that toilet humor alone caught, caught my attention. But the point is, is it caught my attention, and I think that's what it was supposed to do. Um, mm-hmm. As a kid growing up, you know, I've, I've said this a, a bunch of times before, I was a child of my parents' record collection, and that went across the board from – you know, my dad that liked, like, you know, Southern rock bands and the double drummer bands like the Almond Brothers and Skinner and Marshall Tucker Band and 38 Special and, 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 and all that kind of stuff, that even the Doobie Brothers. And I saw all those bands, too, when I was, like, you know, five, six years old. I'm going to Saratoga as early as, you know, four or five of my parents to see the Doobie Brothers and stuff. So I was immersed in all that in a young age. My mom listened to stuff like, you know, Cream, Who, Jimi Hendrix, you know, The Doors, so it was all that kind of stuff in the 60s, but all great musicians. Uh, my dad was the Who fan. So if I really want to pick a drummer that I, that I was influenced by first, it would definitely be Keith Moon. Because, oh, wow, okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm 52, I'm 51 years old. I'm 50, I'm trying to push it already. I forget what, how old I am because I, I really, <laughs> yeah. as, soon as, as soon as life closed down in March of 2020, I forgot all, I lost all track of time. Slips by. Everything. I don't know what yeah. day it is. I don't know what year it is. I don't know what month. I don't know. It's the same day yeah. it was 600 days beforehand. Uh, <laughs> all I know is I'm not back out on tour doing what I love yet. So there you go. It's still the yeah. same day. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but, but all of this, I've had all these influences through my entire life. So the first, the first stuff that really started resonating was like, like I said, Keith Moon and the who, and that was like the first where the first, I think that was probably where I picked up on the drummer more so than anything else in the band, just because of the bombasticness of Keith Moon's playing and all that. And I find it. And now when I look back on all this, I kind of, I really find it funny that my first drumming influence ended up being, you know, my, my really my favorite drummer's hero because my favorite drummer is Neil Parrott and Moon was, was Neil's hero when he was a kid. Sure. So that's really kind of funny in a, in a full circle type, type, type way. Um, so it was Keith Moon first, and then I think next after that really was, was, was Ginger because, you know, as I said, my mom had a bunch of Cream records, and one of the ones she had was Disraeli Gears, and I listened to that, you know, over and over again, not just because I knew the song Sunshine of Your Love, but just because I liked what I was hearing on the album. You know, I liked the more obscure songs on that album, like, you know, I never say the title right. Swablu blah blah, where it's it's like she wore a yellow. It's this song. It's called "She Wore a Yellow Ribbon," but it only goes yeah. by the you know by the title or by the by the initials. Um, that song, "Tales of Brave Ulysses," it's not like just the hits that I gravitated to. It's like all these other rhythms and all these other things that Ginger was doing that I thought was was cool and unique. Um, mm-hmm. But then once you know. My dad happened to pick up Kiss Destroyer and didn't realize what he was buying. He passed it down to me, and I went, oh, my God, who are the monsters on the fucking wall here? Uh, and that was it. <laughs> so by 1976, I had forgotten about the Who for the most part, and then, you know, I was just immersed in Kiss, like pretty much most most young young adult males my age at that point. Um, you know, pretty much that was it. But I... 
I didn't want to be Peter Chris. I wanted to be Gene Simmons. I, Peter Chris yeah. was the last, <laughs> to be honest with you, and I know I'm going to piss off a lot of Kiss fans, and I really don't care. Uh, uh, Peter Chris was the last guy I wanted to be in that, in that, yeah. that whole band. <laughs> I wanted to be Gene Simmons first because he fucking spit blood and spit fire, and that was fucking awesome. <laughs> I wanted to be Paul Stanley next because he was the guy in charge of the band, and he was the, he was the most important guy. Of course, front man. Let's be him. Yeah. I wanted to be ace after that. Peter, you're last. Because uh, at that yeah. point, man, like, <laughs> in 1975, 76, I was a kid banging on pots and pans, and I had a fake guitar, too, or I had a toy guitar. I didn't know what path I was going to take. I just knew I wanted to do something with music. So I didn't know whether or not I was going to play guitar or if I was going to play drums. So it wasn't like I got saw Peter uh, saw Kiss and went, ah. Oh! Like, you know, it's like some kids in the 60s saw the Beatles and went, oh, my God, I want to be Ringo. I did not see Kiss and went, I want to be the Catman. I saw Kiss and went, <laughs> look at the guy blowing fire. That's fucking <laughs> insane. And no, I was attracted to the spectacle of the show. I didn't even care what the hell instrument he was playing. Whatever bass, that's easy. Dum, 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 dum. So, so, so anyways, like, that's where, that's where that went first, right? So then I... So once I started sure. playing drums, like once I actually started taking drum lessons and realized I wanted to be a drummer and started becoming more serious about that, I went back to the Keith Moon phase. And, and then it was back to listening to The Who. And that was, you know, the guy I was trying to emulate. Now we're talking about the late 70s, right into the very early 80s, right when MTV first came on. Well, the next guy that came over and took over for Keith Moon was Stuart Copeland, hands down. Because oh, yeah, okay. at that point in the 80s, I was a huge police fan, still am. But at that point in the 80s, you couldn't turn on MTV and not see some video from Ghost in the Machine on there. Whether it was Spirits mm -hmm. in the Material World, Every Little Thing She Does is Magic, Demolition Man, Invisible Sun. They pretty much had five videos on that album, and they were all in high rotation. So I just kept seeing that black Imperial Star kit or the blue Imperial Star kit, depending on what, what video they were showing you with the Peisty Roods and all that, and just like, just getting, so, just being so excited when I saw Stuart Copeland beating the shit out of those drums. Because he was, he was fucking beating the shit out of those drums. And those videos used to excite me as a kid so much. I'm like, this guy's fucking crazy. So I wanted to try to play police songs. So that was where my energy was like in the real early eighties was trying to like emulate those Stuart Copeland riffs and, and, mm. and, and get that, you know, like I talk about that, like, like I said, you know, like, yeah, <laughs> to get nice. That guy down. nice. So, so <laughs> it was, it was, it was that, it was that whole thing with the bombasticness of the who and all these, you know, the bands that I grew up on listening in my mother's record collection. So, but then also, on MTV at the same time as the police on the first day was this band. And ah, as soon nice. as I, as soon as I saw Iron Maiden, the first day I saw Iron Maiden, I went, Oh my God, what is this? Like, just like it from everything else, like from the police and the who and all the stuff that I've been listening to, this was a total, like the, you know, the needle went right across the record. <laughs> like what the fuck? What is this? These are monsters on stage. He's got a spotlight. The music's like <laughs> fast. It's like, it's all this aggression. This, this is awesome. This is absolutely awesome. So then that first day that MTV came on here, I sat in front of that the entire afternoon waiting for that fucking band to come on with the monsters. <laughs> and about 28 videos later, the band with the monsters came back on again, but it wasn't the same song. Because the first song I saw was the first song I saw was Rat Child. The second one I saw was Iron Maiden. So oh, really, man. in the essence, the song Iron Maiden literally is is a two step punk beat. Da 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 da. When you mm -hmm. speed it up thirty more BPMs, da 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 da. It's a thrash beat. That's what it is. And that's the first time I'd seen that kind of aggression and that kind of music. And I was like, whoa! And that really made something wake up inside that was like this. This is something, this is, this is what I want to go after. It was when I saw Maiden, that's, that's what the, turned something inside that said I want to play heavy music. Or I wanted to play something that 
I wanted to play the same same thing that made people feel the way I'm feeling right now watching this video. And I don't even know, yeah. it's, well, you know, 10 years old what I was feeling yet. All I know was I thought it was fucking awesome as a kid. And I was like, wow, I want to be in that crowd with those kids right there. That's, yeah. that's how it made me feel. So then now I guess we're now going down the road that's called heavy metal because that's literally what it was. So at that point, it's, you know, Ozzy, Black Sabbath. Judas Priest, Maiden, and then one day I saw this band. Or I didn't even see this band. I heard this band. A kid across mm -hmm. the street from me whose brother was like, he was like a senior when we were like in junior high school, right? So okay. he had, you know, he had those pot smoking years on him, let's call it. <laughs> and he goes, <laughs> all right, you guys like Iron Maiden. You guys like Iron Maiden. Well, you got to hear the bass player in this band. And he, point, and he looks at me, he's like, oh, well, you're a drummer. You'll, you know, you'll like this band because the drummer is really good. That's, that's what I got from this guy's brother. The drummer is really good. This is how I'm getting my first introduction to the, the God Almighty Neil Parrott. The drummer is pretty, the drummer is really good. Oh, all right. <laughs> so, is, so is Clive Burr. And I'm sure that's probably what came out of my mouth at that time, too, because I was 12. And, you know, Run to the Hills was the hardest drum song that I knew at that time. So I was like, how good could this guy be? Run to the hills. I can barely play it, you know? So, mm -hmm. so then, then he sits down and puts on Farewell of Kings, and I go, holy Christ. Oh, <laughs> man. I don't know what the hell it is I just heard, but this is the greatest thing I have ever heard in my entire life, and that's what made me realize that Neil Parrott was the greatest drummer ever to walk the earth. Um, and that's, where, <laughs> that's what sent me down the path of wanting to play music that was no longer just boom, boom. Doom, da, doom, da. This is shit, and I actually have to sit down now and take the record and go, yeah, record. Remember those things? <laughs> you have to take that record needle and put it back. Hold on a second. I still didn't get that fill. Wait, hold on again. Wait, ah, oh, shit. Wait a minute. Let me slow it down to 16. Crash. Oh, that's where it is. Seriously doing that shit, slowing the record down to 16 RPM to find out where that crash symbol was because I couldn't play it right when I was trying to play it at 33 RPMs. So that was that. Rush was the Russian Iron Maiden and en encompassed my life until around 1985, uh, where a, a kid, a friend of mine from high school, said, You got to check out this band. I thought they were called Metallica because that's what the tape said. Metallica. <laughs> yeah. All right. What's yeah. Metallica? Metal he goes, it's Metallica, dude. I'm like, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, man. I didn't know. I didn't know what Metallica was. So he gives, me the, he gives me the Metallica tape. I bring that home. I listen to it. I think it's absolutely terrible. Uh, I, I think Fight Fire with Fire is the biggest piece of shit that I've ever heard in my life. I wonder why the drummer couldn't, couldn't stay at the same tempo in the middle of the song. Uh <laughs> That was, was a, I was a fucking crit, I was a critic at fucking 15 years old. No, seriously though, I I hated it because everything that <laughs> look see see the comments. Chris thinks I'm just gonna go there insane on Lars right now. Chris, look at <laughs> look at I got the button. Here, Lars, here's the here's the picture with me and Lars. Here's not you on Lars's drum set. All right, so anyways, um, oh, so but all all the bands that I hated, I, I hated at first. They ended up loving. I fucking thought Metallica was terrible. I thought Slayer was horrendous when I first heard him. Slayer's my favorite band of fucking of all time with thrash metal. I thought Stigmata, wow, okay. the band I played in for twenty years, was fucking horrible when I first when I first heard them. <laughs> this is my own fucking band. So this is, this is how this is how my taste evolved. However, I will say that I never thought Rush sucked when I first heard them. I just I thought it was different because the first time I actually heard Rush was in the seventies at when I when I was um, used to get babysat by the girl girl lived across the street and her older brother played bass and him and his stoner friend used to listen to Rush all the time. I was too young to understand how good they were because at that point I was just like, ah, oh, when, well, when does when does the bass player blow fire and spit blood? He doesn't, <laughs> but he plays keyboards and move pedals with his feet. I don't care. He doesn't spit blood and breathe fire. So, <laughs> so, so eight-year-old Jason didn't care about Farewell of Kings then, but the 13-year-old Jason certainly did. So, yeah. but, so, then, so the first time I heard Metallica, I thought they were horrible. 
I used to think that I'm like that the drumming was just like that's so bad. And then I jumped on the kit and I tried to play Trapped Under Ice and I realized how fucking hard it was to do that at that speed for four minutes long. <laughs> so then I went, oh, maybe this guy, did this, this, maybe I should give this another chance. And I did. And I still, you know, I'll, I will I'll definitely, like Snow Lars button. <laughs> That's up here. <laughs> <laughs> these are all the buttons we had on Twitch. I had like a bump, like all these pictures of Lars that I would put up all the time, just because. And everyone thinks we were making fun of. Like, look, we're not making fun of it. And I would put a picture of me and Lars, like arm in arm together. I'm like, I love Lars, but Lars yeah. will tell you. Lars will tell you out of the big three. Let's call them the big three: Lombardo, Bonate, Lars. <laughs> he, he, he is here. They are fucking here. <laughs> He's not, he's not even in the screen, all right? <laughs> but his bank account is I, I bigger than both of theirs combined. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think you mentioned it too with, with Neil Peart. That was one thing where earlier on in me discovering music and having an interest in drums, that was the first drummer or an earlier drummer that I remember the drums actually sounding like an instrument. You know, not yeah. just something that was kind of adding or keeping the pace. That was one thing where I'd go back and I'm like, what the fuck is this guy doing? What is it? What does yeah, he have his, going on? You know, and then it, actually seeing his kit, you know, for the first time, it's like holy shit! It's that. It's guys. the sound. Of, it's the sound of that drum set that he had for the from the late seventies to early eighties. It's the Permanent mm. Waves Moving Pictures drum sound, which is the kit that resides in my basement. There's just something about the sound of that drum and the way those albums were mixed. There's. It's not just a drummer playing a drum set you can tell that is a band that sat in that fucking room and really took the time to create these songs that they were creating but they also took time to, to pay attention to what the other fucking guys were doing too yeah so because yeah. they're all playing a lot of shit i have mm -hmm. i have the moving a lot of moving pictures um the stems from moving pictures i got because i i got from a, a producer that worked with alex lifeson one time so oh, i have man. like I have moving pictures without the drums, so like I actually can sit there and kind of try to pretend I'm Neil himself. You got to remember back then Whoa. those records were were recorded without a click. But his time is so fucking spot on. But when you listen to these stems and like you can mute some of the tracks, like all right, let's just listen to the guitar and the keyboards only, and you hear all these layers and all these different parts and all this shit that was going on, especially like in a song like the Camera Eye, you're like. Holy oh, shit, man. I never even knew that even existed in this song before. <laughs> but it's just, you could just tell the time that they took to to craft those parts. And and to to be a band like that, that was able to just, you know, turn it on whenever they wanted to and not step on each other's toes while they were doing it, that's that's something to be said right there. Yeah, absolutely. Man, I, 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 can't, I can't agree more, you know. One, one thing I wanted to, you know, kind of, step back a little bit as far as you know you mentioned iron maiden and you know bring us I back to, to, to oh yeah go, go ahead. <laughs> I was I, trying, I was mention, I'm trying to know, find it without ripping my uh without ripping my ears <laughs> out of the phone right now <laughs> <laughs> uh bring, bring us back to a time scanning a local record shop and finding something you know that you were unfamiliar with but solely off of the cover art you know you have iron maiden you have even things like rush you know where there was albums that you know it just pulls you in something that you were unfamiliar with that the, the the cover art just pulled you into having to buy it what was uh, it and, uh, you know did it did it add up to the cover art there's been a few of those over the years if i hadn't been familiar with slayer rain and blood absolutely 100 percent, 10 percent hands down that cover would have made me buy it because that yes. at that point in 1986 that was hell that was hell on the cover of an album and what I find funny, too, is I'm going to say it again. Slayer is my all-time thrash, favorite thrash metal band of all fucking time. I will, I still, this is a, this is a, this is a giant joke, but I kind of, I've joked around with, with some of my really close friends, and we've talked about this, and I've said this, I said, you know, I'm sort of fucking kidding, but I'm not. The end of the world fucking started when Slayer retired and Neil Parent and Sean Reiner died. <laughs> the fucking world oh went to God. shit right after those three <laughs> things happened. Is that an ironic coincidence or what? So, oh, but you know, I've never put that together, but Jesus. Yeah, you're yeah, not you lying. Know, I, well, look, 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 Eric, I've had a lot of time in this pandemic to sit in this fucking room and think about a lot of shit that I should not be thinking about. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh shit, um, that is so, funny. So Slayer, uh, Slayer, sad, is but... always, Slayer is always going to be that benchmark for me. Um, I find what I find funny now is you can walk by fucking H and M stores and see mannequins with fucking Slayer shirts on, like it's fucking goddamn, you know, Calvin Klein fucking style. brand name yeah. shit. And, yeah. But in 1989, this was a scary band. Remember, yeah. this was like this was. I mean, my God, Slayer, that's it's, it's, it's hell walking through the streets compared to what extreme music turned into decades later. Like fucking, like Slayer's like, look, man, we're like Striper compared to. I can't even read this band's logo. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> Dear God. Um, oh, all right, so anyways, Lord. back to that. So the album covers. Um, Slayer Slayer would have been one of those. <laughs> Any, I mean, Maiden, come on. I mean, the. well, I, I guess I was going back. I got into Iron. When I got into Iron Maiden was right when, when, when Number of the Beast came out. So I wasn't familiar with Deano <laughs> Maiden yet. But then a friend okay. of mine at school made, made me become, yes, Chris, you're right. Slayer needs to come back and make the world right again. Um, but, but when I got into Maiden, I went back onto the older catalog and I got the two, the two Deanna records. Now, this is like, this is one of those things I say all the time because people will always ask, people always make me compare the drummers because a lot of times, because first of all, people know that I'm really, really close with Nico McBrain. He's one of my biggest idols and influences and he's one of my dearest friends and I love the man to death. And a lot of times people ask, well, who's better, him or Clive? And I go, you can't, you can't really say who's better. They were both great drummers. Clive yeah. was the first guy I heard in Iron Maiden, and I thought Clive was a fucking amazing drummer because he fucking was. He was awesome. But you, the opening fucking notes of where he goes there should already tell you that the guy replacing him is quite the fucking drummer himself. <laughs> so right. so there's, right. no, there's no comparison. It's two guys that are both equally fucking awesome. Apples and oranges. I like them both. It just depends. Same thing. Well, what do you like? Paul Diano or fucking Bruce Dickinson? Well, I prefer Bruce Dickinson as a, as a whole. But right. I prefer Diano Maiden as Diano Maiden. I don't want to hear Bruce sing Murders in the Room more because I don't think he can do it good. Mm -hmm. I don't want to see your fucking Paul Diano try to sing fucking Children of the Dam, though, either. That's the thing. <laughs> Diano, <laughs> Diano, Diano, Maiden, Diano Maiden is so is so specific. Those two albums are so awesome in their, in their own way. So you can't really compare them. Both of those bands are great. Both of those things, both, all of that is awesome. It's just like people ask me too. Well, what about Paul Bostaff and Dave Lombardo? Dave Lombardo created the house. He created Slayer. Paul added to the added another room on the house. What I mean by that? Just a great drummer. But Paul said it himself. He would not be the drummer he is without Dave. Just like I've said it a million times. I wouldn't be the player I am without Dave and Charlie Benante to to take from. It's just. Though there's some of those guys that are just, you know, so good that, you know, but that's it. But yeah, you can't, yeah. you, 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 what I'm getting at is you can't really do comparisons sometimes with, with these things. Something's just as good here and just as good here. And that's the way it is. So don't try to compare it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Accept no, I, it all for what it is. Yeah. You know, and appreciate the stages of, you know, certain things or even mention, you know, as far as like people completely knocking out Dio for, you know, having his time in Sabbath or whatnot, you know, it's yep. like, it's a different yep. thing. Obviously it's not yep. with Ozzy, you know, it's a different time period. There was some sick shit that came out of it, but I wouldn't compare it. You know, I mean, I think Slayer is a really hard one just as far as with Paul Bostoff and, and uh, Dave, you know, and their styles and different things, but Paul has Holy. a little bit of a different style. And I mean, I absolutely love both of them, but I don't know if I could choose one or the other, you know, tomorrow right. or, yesterday <laughs> right, right, right. but as far as your your drum you know or, or early interests you've mentioned before as far as you you got your first kit at eight <laughs> and your, your your father got you your first kit tell us about this first drum kit what kind was it and and your your dad got it for you what uh the, you first, know, what? the first drum kit that i sat underneath for three hours on the drive home from long island not knowing that there was a drum <laughs> set attached to the roof <laughs> Uh, oh shit! When I yeah, when I was when I was a kid, uh, I got my first. Well, I, 
got my first. I started playing at eight. I got my first kit. I think I was ten because uh, it was it was going into fifth grade, fourth or fifth grade, something like that. Um, and I got it for Christmas. It was just a five piece. It was just a plain old five piece, or not even five piece. What am I talking about? I wish it was a five piece. A three piece red sparkle Del Rey Japanese drum set. Okay. Just, you know, 12 inch rack tom, 20 inch bass drum. The rack tom barely held on to the, <laughs> barely stayed on the on the mount on the kick drum. There actually was a Gretsch snare drum, even though it was a six lug, so it was a student model. Um, uh, uh, this is one of the reasons why I'm, I'm looking, I'm starting to look at the chat, and this is one of the reasons why I have to, I'm, I'm going to kind of call this guy out, sorry, but I'm going to do this because I'm going to, I'm going to start, this is one of the reasons why I got off Twitch because I started getting so annoyed with people and they're interjecting comments when they weren't asked for, first of all, in the first place. Someone's telling me right now, don't forget John Deddy because I was talking about Bostaff and Lombardo. John Deddy does not come into the equation because John Deddy never recorded a studio album with Slayer of original music. So thank you for interjecting on something that didn't need to be interjected on. <laughs> this is one of the main reasons I got off Twitch. I got so sick and tired of people on social yeah. media just like, Baba, oh, you know what? I, without me I, literally going... Hold on, let me show you a visual. <laughs> without literally, without literally saying. <laughs> oh shit, that is awesome. This came out a That's lot. That's really cool. Though. I've this, never this, seen those before. The, the foam fender came out. This, this is our most highly selling, our most high selling merch out, our merch item ever. <laughs> Dude, that fucking I had, rules. I had God, I've never full, seen that before. This was the last one on, on our last tour. I had to have the merch girl. She pulled this for me five days before the tour before the tour ended, so I would make sure that I brought one home. You don't have to like, see now now he's see now he's apologizing for, for, for mentioning for mentioning what he mentioned. You don't have to apologize, I'm just saying. It wasn't something that needed to be brought up. It wasn't like I said, let's discuss every drummer who played in Slayer. <laughs> so we'll start with Dave Lombardo, and then we'll go, we'll go right to the guy who was in Whiplash who replaced Dave Lombardo for a second and couldn't play the double bass drum fell to Angel of Death in 1987 when I saw him Oof. live. Then who was replaced by Dave Lombardo once again, who was then replaced by Paul Bostaff the first time, who was then replaced by John Denny. I've now said John Denny, my very, very good friend. Who was then replaced again by Paul Bostaff, then replaced again by Dave Lombardo, then once again replaced by John Denny again, finally ending with Dave Lombardo. Or, I mean, with uh, Paul Bostaff. Paul Bostaff. That pretty much sums up the Slayer timeline from the start to the end. Any other questions, folks? <laughs> oh. Oh, Wait a second. God. Let's go back. Wait a second. We'll go back. There was uh, one second, too, where Kevin Talley was almost in, too. Kevin Talley almost played in Slayer 2 before Dave came back in the mid-2000s. Really? That's it. Oh, <laughs> shit. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'll, yep. I'll go back and I'll look they, at that myself. They, I don't, I don't want to go too far. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you can. I think Kevin has you know, some, some of the audition videos are up on YouTube somewhere. I, I knew oh, about shit. it. Oh, shit. Wow. 2000, around 2002, 2003. It was right. Or actually, it, was probably, it might have been one into two. Because it was right when Shadows Fall was really making their name. And at the time, my friend Sully was working for Slayer. And he was like, well, they're taking audition videos. If you want to you know, send one in, I can get it to the right connection. I'm like, ah, I, I don't, dude, you know, uh, I don't want it. And, and as much as, like I said, Slayer is my favorite band of all time. I didn't want to try to audition to be the fourth drummer in Slayer. Because at that point, that's what it would have been. And, yeah. and, and Shadows Fall was just starting to do something. So... In my heart of hearts, I'm like, I really want to try to do something with my my own band than try to just audition to get into my favorite band and then just be that guy who's going to sit there with a bullseye on his head because now everybody's going to be watching you because you're the guy who's now in Slayer. So I never right, stand right. You know, I'm, God, you know we're, we got Ozfest next year. Let's see what happens with my with my career. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad I did I did what I did, you know? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. With with that earlier kit, then you you mentioned as far as having you know the the, the struggle of sitting underneath it on the on the way home and whatnot. When you finally got yeah, that, yeah, sorry, bad boy I really set diverged up, off you know, that. I no, really no, no, that's that's, that's that okay. Stuff, not, not 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 a problem. Uh, <laughs> no problem. Yeah, uh, what so what we were was, earlier songs or earlier albums that you were wanting to play with when you were at that point, you know, as far as now discovering different different bands and heavier music? What were things that you were sitting down with playing with earlier on? 
All right, let me at least sum up the kit really quick before that. I got the kit for Christmas, like, before fourth and fifth grade, something like that. But we had brought it home from Long Island where I went with my dad and my stepmother for Thanksgiving on in November. I didn't know that my, my stepmother's father had procured this drum set for my father, okay? So he bought – he they got the drum set somewhere in New York. Okay, get the drum set. We'll, we'll come down. We'll pick it up in Thanksgiving. We'll take it home. We'll put it on top of the car. He's never going to know what's in the box because he's not going to ask. He's a kid. And I didn't ask. Oh, there's a big box going on top of the car. Whatever. Okay. Got in the car, went home. And that Christmas, like, well, wh how'd you get it up here? <laughs> remember remember that box we put on the car when we drove home from, from Grandpa's house? <laughs> like, oh, shit, really? So, so my, my first drum set, I sat underneath for three and a half hours driving home from Long Island the first time I, had, I got it. That added on a few toms over the years, added a four times. A jelly bean kit, white drum, red drum, white drum, silver drum, you know, snare with no bottom head on it as a floor tom. Uh, you know, it was about as ghetto <laughs> as it could be. But, you know, I loved it. Uh, uh, songs yeah, I was yeah. trying to play to was all the stuff that I was I was influenced by. You know, like, you know, it started with, you know, just playing along to anything I could when I was a kid. You know, stuff on the radio, stuff that was on MTV. When I really started learning drum parts was probably when I was getting into, you know, Maiden. And stuff like that. Okay. Um, okay. Maiden, All right. Maiden. I think really Maiden was probably. I mean, I had like a bunch of forty fives and stuff. Like I still remember like my forty five collection of songs that I used to play along to, like waiting for, uh, like fuck, uh, um, working for the weekend by Lover Boy because there's a chance to use the cowbell, and then I put on my we're not going to take it forty five and use the cowbell again. And I, what else? I had 45 in a big country, but big country, you know, so that, you, know, you have to put the 45 on that got tiring. So then finally <laughs> you start, start and then you start learning albums. Finally, like I think the first album I tried to learn front to back was probably number of the beast. So oh, that's, when I, that's when I started learning records and that's where that started. And then after that, I mean, I didn't start with easy records. Then I went into my mother's record collection. So let's pull out Disraeli Gears. Oh, that's going to be a challenge. White Room's already in five. I didn't know what the hell that was when I was 12 years old. I'm just going, dum, 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 dum. I'm just playing along with Ginger Baker. I don't know that I'm playing in an odd time. So I think a lot of this was good that I didn't know what I was doing. By the time I got to music school in Berkeley and learning about odd time and knowing all this stuff, Oh, that's what that is. I've been playing that since I was a kid. I'm glad I didn't know what it was, though, because I was able just to learn it by, you know, learning the rhythms and stuff. I mean, if I had a dollar for every Rush song that I learned just by ear and never knowing the notation, I didn't see notation and stuff on Rush parts and stuff until years after I wasn't even playing the stuff anymore. Like, going through, like, oh, my right. high school years when I play that stuff every day, but... We didn't have all the DVDs and Neil breaking down everything and Joe Bergamini sitting right next to him and me eating lunch with him and all. None of that stuff existed back then. It was just like <laughs> I said, put the record on, put it on at 16 RPM and pray that I can figure out Xanadu. So, <laughs> so, so, that, you know, so that's what it Jesus. was. So Big it, order. It was, right. So it was Maiden, and then it was to Rush, and then as soon, and then after the Rush phase came the metal phase. So now I'm trying to learn, sitting down, trying to learn Master of Puppets. You know, playing those end songs. The 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 Coup de Grave when the the doors really started open was like summer of '86 into '87, because that's when I got Raining Blood, and I I went to Florida with my mom on vacation, and all I did was listen to that 32 minute tape over and over and over again. I knew Rain and Blood, note for note, air drums, and in my head. And I'm like, <laughs> I can't wait to get home and start playing these songs. I got home. I got into the first, like, 20 seconds of Angel of Death and realized that this shit is way harder to really play on drums <laughs> than just go, feet are flying, dude. I got on the drums, like, 30 seconds in. I'm just like... <sighs> <laughs> I literally felt like I was in gym class and I just got yelled at to go do laps for like 10 <laughs> minutes. I was just like, <sighs> and I did not got through the, through the second, you know, second verse yet. And I'm going, how the fuck am I going to get to the last song? I'm like, there's like 12 <laughs> other songs that, that I have to play now. And they just get faster. So it was quite, it was quite an eye opener. And then the next summer was among the living. 
And as soon as I got that record, it was just like, all right, so Among the Living. Oh, so he's, yeah. he's blazingly fast the first song, and then you go to Cotton Amash. All right, so the hands are even faster on this song, and then we complete with Phil's that <laughs> I still don't know what the fuck he's doing. And I played in Anthrax for fucking over 16 years now. I don't know. <laughs> I'm still like, I don't know what you do here, but this is what I do, and the band comes in, and that's all that matters. <laughs> oh, so maybe the next song, maybe the next song the awesome. album gets, will get easier, which is I Am The Law. All right, first three minutes. Yeah, that's good. Look. Oh, wait, now there's a solo section. Oh, now the solo section goes to 300 BPMs. Oh, then let me guess, there's going to be dull bass probably. Yup. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> but you're waiting for a break Son on of the a record. Because like, then like, when you're learning the album, you're like, all right, well, the first five songs are a bitch, but once I get to song six, I get a break. I'm just going, there's no break on this album. There's literally no break. <laughs> there's no break on this album. And, you know, you forget about these things. I, I got called a, a few weeks ago because there was a chance that someone's back wasn't feeling too well. And there was a chance that somebody might have had to go play a gig with a certain band that we're talking about right now. I haven't played live with them in nine years. Now, remember, these songs are still in my DNA. Played them live with them for tours and no problem. But when you haven't played them in a band situation for nine years, and then the thought about going, oh, shit, I might have to jump back on stage with these guys. Then all yeah. the anxiety comes in. How, what the, how the fuck does this end? What's the ending on that? So last week, I just go and pull up this, you know, I pulled, I pulled together a, a, a montage of Anthrax live stuff. I have all this stuff over the years that Scott sent me when I was learning songs for whatever tour or whatnot we'd be doing, just so I'd be in the know of what they were doing at that present moment. Mm hmm so I'm playing along all the Among the Living stuff. Like this song's like right in a row, Cotton Amash, right into Among the, right into I Am the Law, right into like the ones that are in the set, right into Indians. And my right hand is just like, fuck you, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like, and I'm like, this, fuck you, Charlie. God damn it. <laughs> I'm sending him a text the other day. How's your back feeling? I'm feeling good. Good, thank God. I don't want to come in and do this gig right now. And it's not that I didn't want to do it. I would more than love any chance I get a chance to go and step on stage with those guys to fucking blast. But the point is, like right now, all I've been doing is practicing jazz, working on DD stuff for this swing gig that we have at the end of the month next next month. Nice. That's yeah. all I've been doing is working on on swing shuffles, jazz triplet stuff i'm not working on double bass and fucking fast shit i have one practice a week with shadows fall and that's the only time i'm playing any kind of metal right now so it's it's not like it's not like it's gone it's just not fresh up and like oh we're gonna we're gonna, gonna play with anthrax tomorrow oh that's awesome and then the other guy on my shoulder is like the songs that you haven't played in a decade Great. <laughs> that's awesome yeah, it's awesome, isn't it? No, it's not, it's not awesome. <laughs> I'm sore as hell. <laughs> so, so it's like, you know, so I go through the set a couple times and I'm like, all right, if, if I have to go do this, I can do it. We're, we're going to pull it off. It's going to be fine. No big deal. But it's not, it's not like it's not without some anxiety because I are, you know, already uh, I talk about, I talk about how Slayer is my favorite thrash metal band of all time. Charlie Benante and is my favorite thrash metal drummer of all time. I mean, I always say Charlie and Dave, but Charlie is my, if I have to pick one, if I can't have chocolate and vanilla, I'm going to pick Charlie because I've taken most of my playing style from him. We're very similar as people. We're extremely close. Uh, it's just, and, and we have, we have a, we, we have a kinship between the two of us and there's something to be said for that. And, and a lot of the times when I, you know, I refer to this guy as the greatest guy in thrash metal drumming and the, and the biggest innovator. And when at the end of the day, when he fucking calls me and goes, Hey, can, can you, can you help me out? That fucking, that really, that really speaks volumes to me. It makes me, it makes me know after all these years that I did something that I'm doing something right. Cause when, yeah. When your hero is calling you up to go, hey, can you take over for, for me and my band for a day? That's a big fucking deal. Whether it's one show, two shows, a tour, a week, whatever. It's still, every time I've played with them, I'm still, it's still been like, oh, fuck. This is like, you know, and that's how I was for like probably the first year I was in Overkill too. Even though they call me and they say I'm a member and I'm a, I'm a full member of Overkill. It's my band. It's, I can say that and it's. But for that first year or so, it's just like you're looking around on stage. You're like, 
fucking A, man. And I was like that with Flotsam, too. All the bands that I've joined that I was fans of, it's, it's a thing where you're like, holy shit, I, this is like, this is my band now. Uh, this right. is pretty fucking right. cool, you know? Like, yeah. it's, it's, it's fun. And I think it's persevering awesome. through, too, you know, because I've listened to a lot of your interviews. I mean, even over the years, read a lot of different things, too. And, you know, mentioning as far as, you know, some of the time where you're feeling like, man, I'm getting a little bit older. I feel like maybe this is just my time to not do this shit anymore. And, you know, finally, you know, kind of having that push to be like, well, I'm going to try this shit again and hopefully it works. And, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, that's that's nice that, you know, it finally did, you know, kind of have that have that push and then further into, you know, having these opportunities, too. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm still so close to quitting every day. It's not funny. (laughs) Oh, oh, oh my god I'm 51 I'm not going to be doing this shit at 52 <laughs> yes you are yes you are uh, you've said this it. for about 20 years now Every, I think from the moment that I I think literally and my wife would probably back me up on this so it's a good thing I'm not in the house right now and I'm out here uh, I think uh, from the moment that I quit my state job and I quit the, the, the full time job and that that the security of a weekly paycheck and health benefits and all that. Once the, when, when I closed the door on that and walked away and decided to do music full time and okay, I'm going to, we're going on Ozfest and I'm going to jump on this, this shadows fall train and let's see what happens with this. Let's pray this works out. Um, you know, if, if I went back 20 years ago, because it was literally 20 years ago this year, uh, would I do it again? Absolutely. But I mean, I, I'm not going to tell you it still hasn't been without plenty of those times where I'm like, oh, fuck, did I make the right decision here? Or, oh, fuck, what, <laughs> what am I going to do now? Or, oh, fuck, I can't go back to work. Or, fuck, I guess I got to go back to work. And it's every, time that, <laughs> uh, it's every time I've thought that. Hi, Scott Robertson, biggest Flotsam fan in the world. Um, uh, every time I've thought that either, well, I guess I'm going to get a fucking job. I, I either get called for a band or a gig or a session or something. So every time I fucking, it, it's like literally like the Godfather, every time I try to get out, they pull me back in. Every time I get the window <laughs> shut, every time I get ready to shut the window and go, all right, I had a great run. I went to Europe a million times. I played in a big four band. I played in some of the greatest bands in fucking thrash metal, sold a million records myself and my own band. That's some pretty fucking awesome shit. Mm-hmm. Knock, knock, knock. Hey, you want to come play with us? Uh, I was going to quit. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. All right. I guess I won't quit. <laughs> God damn it. I'm going uh. to quit. But there's no, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to, I don't want to, well, I mean it more so because there's those days where I wake up and as much as I feel like, when I get out here and I look around this room and I see the accolades and I see everything I've done and I see what I've worked so hard for. It makes me keep pushing to want to do it every single day that I can. But it's those days where I played and after two hours of playing thrash metal, I sit here and I feel like I got run over by a fucking semi. And I go, and I go, am I fucking getting old? I mean, because this shit's starting to fucking like really like (laughs) take a toll on me. And I'm like, you know, and I start thinking, (laughs) no, Paul. (laughs) (laughs) Paul, you got to send me an audition tape. I don't know. Are you any good? It's my old singer, my old man. He says, want to come play with us. Um, And it's every time that I I start going, maybe I'm just getting too old for this shit. And I'm like, nah, it's just a bad day. Just fucking sore day. We'll just just keep working out. We'll we'll be all right. Just fucking, just get another massage up tomorrow. You'll be fine. I just start thinking about like how I feel sitting home on a pandemic. I mean, thankfully, I've been playing a lot. Like the year that I was doing Twitch, and I play all the time, so it's not like I'm sitting home just fucking getting fat, doing nothing. I'm still in playing shape. I still have all this stuff on my fucking radar. I'm still active. I just want to get back out there and do it that way. And yeah, and yeah, for sure. And just not be. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, a lot of people, a lot of people in that situation, look for, looking for that live, you know, and you have. A lot of cases where it's it's actually working pretty well. You know, you have Megadeth that is just about finished with this, you know, tour with hate breed and all that. But then there's other situations where it's like people plan this huge fucking tour and you're two shows in and all of a sudden you're having to cancel the whole thing. You know, so it's that's a it's a big risk right now for sure. Still, yep, absolutely. Unfortunately, um, and that Let, Megadeth tour I thought was okay. over. I thought the, I thought that tour was over. I thought they just couldn't go to Canada because Canada was like the last couple of shows they had to postpone to 2022. 
because there's something yeah. going on that they won't let the let the tour in or something. Yeah, I don't I don't know exactly what was going on with that. I think they have like maybe two shows left on it, but uh, it was I mean three. as far as I thought. Oh, I was saw. There, is there three left? Okay, uh, that's, okay. that's nice. what I thought. I read. But I could be wrong. Who knows? <clears throat> right. Let, let's dig into you know the the killer collection that you have as far as over the years some of the cool things that you've had you know some of the one one of a kind pieces you know maybe maybe one or two things that you have on hand I mean we can obviously move into the complete moving pictures kit but you know things that you have signatures <laughs> things that you have you know on hand sign uh, uh, snares and symbols what are a couple of things you have in your uh, in your collection there that you'd like to show and and how did they come about. A lot of that stuff is in is is literally inside in my cellar though, because it's like most sure. of my stuff is somewhere between. I mean, I have fucking so much shit. This is this is. I mean, it's <laughs> what people have to understand is, like I said, I'm 51 years old. I started collecting drums like when I was like 22. I mean, like really, that's really when I started like getting into vintage drums and trying to find things in pawn shops on the road or something. So it's not like. I just fucking went nuts on eBay for a day and bought all these fucking drums and all this shit. I mean, this has taken me 30 years to amass this stuff and a lot of stuff too, sure. endorsement stuff, et cetera, et cetera. So like it's, it's taken a while for these things to actually collect. Now I'm, I'm chuckling about this right now because we we're just having this this three way conversation the uh, last week between me me John Tempesta and 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 Charlie. We we're just talk just talking about Charlie Benante. And it was the three of us, and as most people know, John used to tech for Charlie way way back in the beginning of yeah. the Anthrax days. They're like fucking best buddies from the neighborhood, and you know they're like two peas in a pod. So the three of us are on this three way text about drums, and Charlie's like, "You two are insane." with the amount of shit that the two of you have. Because <laughs> we, we do. Charlie like has like like a couple drum sets and a few snares and like we're just fucking so so he goes, How much shit do both of you guys have? So me and John sent back a comprehensive just text list of what we could think of off the top of our heads, like, all right, like just listing the kits out and then like, you know, the signature kit and then like, oh, and then it's this snare. But then like you see these other errant text messages coming. Oh, yeah, and there's another five snare drums in Jersey. Oh, and then I forgot there's this other kit that I have with the cult that's over in England. And it's up there. <laughs> this other shit that's just this further proving that the two of us have way too many fucking drums. So, <laughs> but, you know, we will sell things eventually. Um, yeah. there's, there's some things you can see on the wall that are up behind me in my studio. Um, mm -hmm. From the top over here. There's a symbol. There's three symbols that are above my above my kit on the wall. All right, uh, I'm I'm trying not to drop my nickel McBrain snare drum right now as I do this. <laughs> and if you, all right, so right above my finger is three symbols. Yep. There's one that's hidden, which you can't see, is a Motorhead symbol, followed by a Slayer symbol, and at the top there's a Hatebreed symbol. On the other wall, Damn. which you guys really can't see either, there's a Mudvayne symbol. There's one of Joey's symbols from Slipknot. There's a Charlie Benante symbol. There's me with anthrax, that picture that's above my door, uh, some overkill stuff. There's a whole bunch of shit that's up on the walls. This is my kit right here that we're sitting at. Um, yeah. Wow. Uh, shit. There's a lot. There's a lot of things in here. There's two. There's two guitars that are on the wall right here. One is signed by Black Sabbath. One is signed by Iron Maiden. Man. The real band. <laughs> the real ones. <laughs> the, right. the real ones. Like the. The six-piece Maiden with Bruce from OzFest 2005. The four-piece original Black Sabbath. There is no other Black Sabbath <laughs> members from 2005. All right. Um, this nice. one will probably piss off some drummers. <laughs> this is uh, Ooh, nice. uh, one of uh, Nico McBrain's snare drums that was used on Live After Death. Man, wow. Also known as the Bonham... Superphonic. Uh, nice. The main reason, which is the main reason why why Nico played it, because he's a bottom freak, um, which is the main reason why he plays the Ludwig snares. Um, I probably bugged him for a good uh, 2005 to I think I finally got it in 2013 or 14. I probably bugged him for almost okay. 10 years, like almost 10 years. I'm like. <laughs> 
I was like, come on, sell me one of those superphonics that you got. And, and over the years, he's given me, uh, he gave me a symbol back in 2005 on Drummer Live when we did that together, um, which is over there. He gave me one of the Nico signature bell ride uh, symbols right off, took it right off his kit. And he took it. This is the greatest. <laughs> This is so good. It fucking pissed Braun off so bad. So 2005 Ozfest, there was three drummers that followed Nico McBrain around like a puppy, like puppies. And that was me, Braun from Mastodon, and Matt McDonough from Mudvayne. Like, everybody called us the Three Stooges because Mo, Larry, and Curly <laughs> were, we were together every single night. We would just get beers. We'd go watch Maiden every single night. We'd hang out with Nico after the show. That was our thing. Like, every, every <laughs> Fucking night. So, so, um, oh my God, I'm, get, I'm, I'm totally digressing off the story because now I'm, I'm starting to get so excited about it. So, all right. So, uh, a couple, so this is, we established the, uh, the, uh, the Three Stooges here. So, a couple years <laughs> later, we're playing a festival, we're playing Heavy MTL up in Montreal, and it's Iron Maiden's on it, Shadows Fall, and Mastodon. Now, Nico's kid is on stage because they're headlining. So, Nico's kid's in the back, it's covered up. And so we're backstage, and Nick goes, he goes, let's go watch Braun play with Mastodon. Yeah, so me, me and my wife and Nick, we go watch, we go watch Mastodon play. So we're on the side of the stage, and we're watching Braun. He's seeing us, you know, waving at us, smiling. He sees Nick over there. He's smiling, laughing it up. So, so Nick, in the, in, the, in the course of the show, Nick goes, because I had asked him earlier about the ride, something he goes, remind me at the show. I'll give it to you at the show. I'm like, oh, awesome. So he goes over, he goes over to his drum set, pulls the one off the fucking drum set, he comes over and hands it to me on the side of the stage while Brud, or while Brud, my wild, I have a friend, friend named Brud, while Braun is playing. So I'm going to be Braun. This is what you see. <laughs> like, what the fuck? How come he get? And then like the song ends and like, you see, he's like, how come? Oh, he gets at me, where? He gets a symbol and I don't. And I'm just, I'm just standing there like, I don't know, buddy. I, I, I just, he just gave it to me. What am I supposed to say? No. <laughs> so, so, right, so in, get, shit. this is the, this is, so I'm getting to the point of all this shit that Nico's giving me. So I'm bugging him for like five years. Every time we go to Rock and Ribs, because we used to have a, we used to have a, a condo in Deerfield Beach, which is right by Boca. So when we would be down there, we'd always go and have dinner with Nico. So I'd always ask him about this, about the superphonics. So one year we're we're about to go for dinner, and he calls me up and he goes, he goes, hey, he goes, bring some money with you. I go, <laughs> I go what? Can <laughs> we didn't bring some money with me? He goes, I found one of those damn drums you keep bothering me about. <laughs> So, so I'm like, <laughs> fucking great. I'm finally going to get the Superphonic. So I don't know. See, I don't even know that it's one of the drums. I just want one. I just wanted one from him. I just wanted one that was in his collection. Uh -huh. So he brings it to me and he goes, and he, and he, and he, <laughs> it's like, all right, it's out in the car. So we go out to the Jag. <laughs> he pulls it out of the trunk and he goes, now, I'm not certain that it's on Live After Death, the album. He goes, but I am certain that it was on the truck for the tour. I go, that's good enough for me. Wow. <laughs> so that's one of my, one of my prize pieces is, uh, is my Nico snare drum. Um, yeah, wow. What I a have, story too, holy shit, that's awesome. Yeah, it is quite the story. Um, <laughs> I have the Bonzo, my Bonzo kit. Vista Light replica. This is one of my favorite Ooh, snares, which is the Neil 40th anniversary DW snare drum. Man. Um, and me being a DW pedal endorser, fortunately, I have one of the 250 that were made. Of course, I paid Damn. for it, but, uh, you know, uh, what I do, do find extremely funny is how much these things go up in price after someone passes away. That snare Ooh. drum, that snare drum that I just showed you, Okay, uh -huh. I paid, I probably paid somewhere around a grand for that, even at a endorser discount from DW, somewhere probably sure. around thousand dollars, maybe a little bit more than a thousand dollars. I saw one of those sell on fucking eBay two weeks ago for fifteen grand. Oh my 15 god! Fifteen grand, and I went, 
well. Wow. Well, dude, if that was if I should have bought four more of those. That would have been better than the <laughs> stock market that I lost. Shit. <laughs> you know? Like, my God. I mean, I would never sell that drum, but just amazing, like, you know, the, the, the value in that. So that yeah, drum, wow. I have a snare. I have a Slingerland artist snare drum inside that's on my Moving Pictures kit, which is the snare drum that he used for many, many years before he went to DW. And that he signed for me. Uh, the first time that I met him. So that's prob that is probably definitely my most prized uh, piece of like memorabilia as far as like a sign thing is definitely the snare drum that he signed. I mean, I've got, I've got four pairs of his sticks. I've got a, uh, a postcard that he sent to me when I was 15 years old, and that's still pretty cool. Uh, wow. <laughs> um, so like I said, I've got Nico's. I've got Nico's symbols. Uh, I've got Charlie's. Got Charlie's symbol. I've got one of Charlie's snare drums. I've got one of Mike Portnoy's snare drums. Uh, I told you about the symbols. Most of the kits are just stuff that I've <clears throat> collected over the years for either vintage reasons or there's a reason behind it. Like the pearl drums that I have. I have my fur, my reference pure kit, which is a purple kit. <clears throat> That's in cases downstairs. That was one of the first kits I got with Pearl. I have this kit that I keep in my studio. I have my overkill kit that's green and black that's in New Jersey. I have a brand new one that's being made for next year for our tour cycle. Um, oh, I have a, yeah, uh, I have a, a brand new uh, master, master's, uh, what is that? MCR, master, master's reserve. Oh, okay. That they just, yeah, Masters, Ma Masters Maple Reserve, they just sent me. That's the that's the new kit that I'm using in Massachusetts for Shadows Fall. Um, it is not mine to keep, though, sadly. It is just a loaner kit. Uh, okay. <laughs> because I could, because, uh, you know, the thing was, uh, they're, they're making me, I mean, I, you know, there's only, there's other people on the roster that they need to have a budget for. It can't be just because I've got a big <laughs> Don't uh, fucking ruin this. <laughs> yeah, it's like I wanted something. I wanted something I could use for both bands. I wanted something I could have used for the reunion, and I wanted something I could use for Overkill for next year once we once the new record drops or the new tour cycle. Because I've been using my green and black kit with them now. For, that kit's four years old now. I've seen two record cycles, so mm -hmm. now it's it's time to replace that. But there was nothing with the pandemic and stuff. Pearl just couldn't get. Like my rep was like, I really want you to play a Masterworks kit, which is the top line series. I've been, you know, I've almost been with the company for 10 years and it's usually takes 10 years before you can get a Masterworks kit. So I'm even like a year and a half ahead of, you know, when they usually would get you, you know, allow an endorser to have one. So I didn't want to miss that opportunity. Yeah, but he's like, wow. I don't think I can have that ready for the Shadows Fall show. He goes, we can have it ready for the Overkill tour in March, which literally is more important. That's a tour. This is just sure. a one-off show. But he goes, what if we can, what if we can just provide a loaner for you for the show? That way you have something new to play with them for the show. I'm like, well, that's awesome. So that's why I'm using the, that Masters Maple Reserve. It's a, it's a blue with a silver racing stripe. And I really like it. Like, it's nice. It's oh, the first, damn. It's the first kit that I've had that has 16 by 22 inch kick drums, too. I've been playing 18 by 22s for like the last probably 15 years. So I haven't, I mean, and just, you know, two inches off the, off the, the depth of the drum really, it does, it does make that much of a difference. So you'd think it really wouldn't make that much of a difference, but it does. They're definitely way more, they're way more punchier. Like I've been listening to like, you know, just like some phone recordings of practice and stuff, and you can hear them cutting through, but um, definitely you, you, but you lose a little bit of the, uh, of the depth with the, with the uh, 16. So I oh, decided okay. to stick with 18 by 22s for my next kit. Oh, I, I like, yeah, I, I, like having, I like having the boom. I like having the boom. Right. <laughs> All right. I was gonna. Say, I was gonna ask if there was something recent that you had played, or some reason why there was a a change in the depth like that. Um, but it's yeah, they, I mean, they, didn't, they didn't have 18s to send. So oh, we okay. Got 16, we we can send you 16 by 22s, and I'm like, ah, that's all right. You know, no big deal because in in the end, it was only going to be for one show, anyways. For the you know for right. you know December. So right. I figured okay. I I figured I would be able to live with that. But I I, I was I was curious anyways because like I said, I hadn't played. A sixteen by twenty two kick drum in a long time, so it was interesting just to get a get a different perspective. Nice, nice. Okay. Yeah. Now, now on you know on kind of the, a similar topic, I wanted to ask about as far as like 
while being on the road, you know, and through all the years of different bands that you've played with and, and Nico and, and, and knowing Dave and Neil, what are maybe, you know, some tips or tricks that you learn from another drummer while being on the road? And, and what I mean by this is I, I, was in, I was interviewing Kevin from the Acacia Strain, and he told me about that when he plays live, he puts a who, pair of drumsticks oddly, under his butt. He sits on them. Oddly told me. And I've done it ever ago, since. Who oddly told me two days ago, you'll have fun with this guy pertaining to this, to this podcast. <laughs> oh shit! Okay, <laughs> I literally okay, just nice. gave I literally just gave out. Kevin I literally just gave Kevin a hi hat stand like two weeks ago. He's like, "Hey, dude, you got a hi hat stand? I can borrow. I got a gig tomorrow. My hi hat stand just broke. He only, he lives like forty minutes away from me." <laughs> oh, sick! Wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And that was something that he had mentioned. I was like, "Shit, I'm gonna try that." And every show I've played since, I'm like, "This rocks." I don't I, mean, I, I don't drop a ton of sticks, but yeah, it, it helps. I hate to break this to you, and I hate to break it to Kevin, too. He's not the first person to think of that. That is a very, very old Kenny Arnoff trick that Kenny actually, actually, I think he put that in his first video, too. Oh, really? Wow. Okay. Oh, yeah. Shit. Yeah, I, I, teched for, I teched for Kenny back in 1986 at a, at a drama, at an expo, music expo that I used to, a uh, store I used to work for up here. Years and years wow. and years ago, and Kenny's been doing that since the early 80s. Okay, wow. I, and I think, I, I can't remember who exactly he had referenced, but I think Kevin had said that he saw somebody on a video or, or somebody that. playing live. I've that, seen that, that, that a bunch, too. yeah. I, I've yeah. seen that a bunch. I, I, I don't, I don't I, I've tried it. I can't, I can't do that because most, okay. most of the time I don't play in a pair of shorts that have a pocket in them in the first place because I'm mm -hmm. usually like, you know, Adidas basketball shorts or something like that. There's no pocket, and I'm not just going to yeah. do that. <laughs> the only place we really could go, I can shove it down my ass crack and hope that you know. <laughs> Pulling out splinters, that I yeah. mean that that might help you get a little bit more speed. Why is this up, so. Uh, so is that pine tar on there? No. <laughs> oh my god! Uh, um, does, does anything come to mind as tip, far as as far as personal experience? Tips or tr tips or tricks? Um. Uh, oh, yeah, but not, right, not from funny. the road, really. Not not from the road, really. I can tell you a good warming up trip trick that I got from one of my teachers to, in case you okay. get in a situation where you get fucked and you don't have time to warm up because that doesn't happen when you're on tour. Uh, like a lot. Like, I don't know, the one time when Shadows Fall was coming in for our first fucking show in Berlin ever back in 2002 with Kitty, we literally pulled up to the venue during our changeover time. So literally, I walked oh, in the van, I, we walked in the venue from being in a van for like eight hours. It was freezing cold. I walked in the venue onto the stage. It was to the point where like our gear was there, fortunately, and, and Kitty's, Kitty's fucking road crew was cool enough to set up our ship for us so we could literally just walk in and fucking play. And that's what we did. And the whole hour prior to the gig, I'm just going, man, this is just, Fucking, I hate fucking playing cold. I hate playing cold. I hate it. It's the I, and and it's it's really weird because when I was a kid, I would just jump on the kit and rip, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, I could do that up until about twenty two, twenty three or so, and then I realized that I needed to start warming up. And I like once I lost that, just being able to just jump on there and play. Then then I just started getting way inside my head about warming up. And a lot of times, that really is what it is. It's just the mental aspect of it. But sure. if you get stuck. And I know most most heavy metal drummers don't have a pair of brushes with them, but if you're smart enough to study with a jazz drummer like I have through my, my history of teachers, you'll have a pair of brushes in your stick bag because if you never use them to play with, you can still use them to warm up with. So luckily I had this exercise that my teacher called the 30 or the 90 second warm up. Okay. And basically what you do is you're gonna you're not you're not just, you know, whacking in the air like you're like you're using a stick okay basically you know you're turning the brush it's hard for me to do this and for you guys to be able to see this correctly and keep the shot happening so it's a technique called wagging the brush so basically what you're going to do and the, the the point of it is to be able to wag the brush and not have the brush do this in your hand you don't want it moving, oh okay 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 you want you want to apply the hinge you're going to use hinge turn or hinge hinge grip. You're going to press your, your thumb and to that's your fulcrum right there, okay? That's the only thing that's gripping the brush is, is, is that spot right there, okay? Fingers go around the brush. 
the fingers stay steady on the brush, the brush wags. My hand does not, the brush does not move. The best part is if you have like with these old Promark uh, <clears throat> brushes when they had the logo on them before they worn off, a good way to tell is do I, how do I know the, I'm not spinning the brush, the logo's not moving. See so the you logo, know, okay. You see the logo, yep. right? So you lock that in and you got 30 seconds this way. Now remember, the brush is not moving. It's not spinning in my hand. If the brush is spinning in your hand, you're doing it wrong. And that's hence totally ruining the point of doing the exercise. Okay? But when you're doing it correctly, all the muscles in your forearm start to burn. This sucks. Okay? Making sure that I'm not moving <laughs> that brush. I don't have my I don't have a stopwatch on, so let's pretend it was 30 seconds. So then I'm going to go 30 uh -huh. seconds this way. So same thing. I can already tell my right hand is always the bug because it's the weaker hand. I'm a lefty on a righty kit. So I have to pay more attention when I'm wagging the brush with this side because I already feel the tendency for the brush to want to move. So it's taking a little bit more for me to hold that brush in position and not let it go. And I don't want to be flapping my arms either doing it either. I want to right. stay locked in there. Still going to huh. be wow. opening. It's going to be opening up everything in my forearm here. Then lastly, single stroke roll in the air for the last 30 seconds. This is where you get 90 seconds, 30 seconds one hand, 30 seconds the other, 30 seconds together, 90 seconds. So when Shit. that's done, wow. the brushes go down, you stretch your hands out, you make sure you do prayer stretch this way. I do three ways, this way, 30 seconds each, 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 uh, each way, and then you'll take your hands individually that way. Now, I normally do that before I warm up for 20 minutes. <laughs> that night? Oh, wow. All okay. I, all I, that, see, my teacher, that's all he did. That was his warm-up. In the 90 seconds, and I'm good to go. That's it? Yeah, I'm good to go. I'm not good <laughs> to go, dude. Like, I can play 200 BPM metal. I'm not fucking good to go. Like, my, my hands feel a little, like, ready to pick up the warm-up sticks now, but... But that night, that's all I did. It was the 90-second warm-up in the van, fucking run inside the venue, throw my shorts on, run right on stage and go, great, crushing Belial. Fuck. My hands are going to fall off, you know? So that's probably one of the, the biggest ones I can tell you. Another one is always make sure you have plenty of clean underwear and socks. And I know it sounds stupid, but literally, when I pack for tour – Five shirts, a pair of pants, maybe a backup pair of pants, two pairs of shorts, 21 pairs of underwear. Why? <laughs> I'm gone. I'm gone 18 days. 21 pairs of underwear. What does that mean? That means that I don't know if I don't if I don't hit laundry at all on the tour, which rarely ever happens, at least with Overkill. Overkill is one of those bands, like their most cleanly band that I've ever been in. Like there's always like there's always a laundry stop or we'll send out for laundry. I'm like, oh, this is great. I love this. Rather than like, uh -huh. all right, well, the tour is 18 days long. I got 17 pairs of underwear. There's going to be one day I'm free balling it if I can't find them somewhere <laughs> alive. But I never, I never get to that point anyways because I'm always hotel sink guy. It doesn't matter. I can be five days. If we're six days into the tour and we get a day off, I'm in the hotel washing all my clothes, hanging out the window. Don't you, didn't you pack enough shit? Yeah, but if I don't, if I can just keep rotating these, I don't have to pull no, the no. clean ones out of the bag, you know? <laughs> I don't have to get under the bus. It's called being lazy. If I yes, I could have to get the key, get my luggage out under the bus, but in order to do that, I gotta pull six pieces of luggage out first to get to mine. Now I'm just gonna watch these in the sink. <laughs> I'm gonna watch these in the sink. Oh damn! I mean, those are those are both good things too. You know, I mean, especially you know, get, kind of mention the the, the pre-show workup. I mean, that's always something too that I appreciate hearing. But uh, I mean, for for anybody looking to tour or you know, touring early on, where now, uh, like for your first tour, you know, as far as first going on the road and 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 you know, doing a run with a band, was that something that you were prepared for? Did you have it in mind as far as you know, bringing plenty of underwear? or was the majority of that thing having to, you know, having to oh, free ball God. that? My first tour, you know, my first, uh, my first, my first tour was a fucking nightmare, to be quite honest with you. Uh, oh. <laughs> like, fucking, like, seriously, <laughs> my, my first tour was probably one of the most grueling tours I've ever done in my life. And it was probably a good idea to have that be the first one, because anything after that just is like, fucking crazy. <laughs> like, 
this is never going to be any shittier than this. All right, <laughs> good. Then sign me up. I'm good. All right. Uh, First of all, and anybody who's in a fucking touring band shudders when they hear this fucking statement. Six weeks in Europe. Uh, I'm, 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 I've not never, say, never done, I'm not going to say any more. Yeah. I'm just going to let that sink in for a second. <laughs> Now we're going to go one worse. Six weeks in Europe in 1997, when there was no technology. No technology. There was no phone to keep you occupied and no phone to tell you where the nearest coffee shop or massage or food was or call home. Call home? What's that? That's a fucking card that's got some fucking number on it that I can't figure out. I can't figure out this payphone, but I'm going to smash the fucking receiver into it for 15 minutes to try to get it to work. These are the things that you have to deal with on tour before technology took over our lives. So my first tour was, oh my six, weeks, was six weeks in Europe in 1997 when I played in the band Crisis. And why I say this was the most grueling because it was six weeks in Europe and a band that's in the fucking two spot on. Wait, were we in the two spot or the, or the three? Spud Monsters? No, we were in the three spot. Spud Monsters were the headlining band. It was more so a hardcore tour. Spud Monsters were the headlining band. There was a band called, called Kickback that was from France or a hardcore band. Crisis, we were the middle band. Then there was a band from Accuracy called, from, from Germany called Accuracy. And then there was another band from Germany called Total Moon. They were the number one band. Five bands on one bus. One more time. Five bands on one bus. <laughs> Six oh, weeks shit. in Europe, the smelliest part <laughs> of Europe that you can go to when days when there weren't club showers like there are nowadays. Five bands on one bus. Six weeks in Europe. Okay. Oh my God. <laughs> so this is a long ass fucking tour. It is a long ass tour. It's a long ass tour. I'm, I'm battling tendonitis problems for the first time in my life. I didn't really know what the problem was. I didn't know it was really coming from my neck. I thought it was an arm problem. The point is there was all this shit going on, you know, shows. You don't know if people are going to come. Hopefully, is there going to be catering? Well, it was catering in the morning yesterday. Maybe there might be food. Oh, there's no food today. What the fuck? This is what I want to do with the rest of my life. Fuck this. I got home from that tour and I was just like, I'm like, this sucks. I don't want to do this. Um, and fortunately, it was, I realized that it was just the circumstances. And, and it, it was really more so the atmosphere that, I, that, was, that was created at that time with the people and whatnot. Um, I'm glad that many, many years later, most of us were able to, to mend our fences. Um, and I really do cherish the relationships I do have with the two guys. I, I am still friends within that band. I was Alan Gia. So, okay. So that's cool. There's always, always good things that, that come out of things, but it was one of those things. I just realized that it wasn't, I didn't want to, I didn't want to tour. I just didn't want to tour in that situation. Um, sure. So not to say that that's the worst moment I've ever had on tour. Cause I will definitely say the worst moment I've ever had on tour was thinking I was going to die in a Belgian rest area in 2015 with the rest of with the rest of flotsam and jetsam and destruction and and nervosa too and yes we we all did think that was going to happen our bus broke down and uh caught on fire next thing you know we ended up in this fucking rest area two miles down the road from the bus where the bus broke down on the border of belgium and holland little did we know that the that area was a very high muslim area oh uh, man Enter all the Westerners with long hair and tattoos into the rest area. Fuck. Slowly but surely, one car became two, two became four, five became six. Next thing you know, there's like 30 Muslim dudes hanging out outside waiting for all of us to come outside. Tensions got heated inside the building, too. Cops would not come to the rest area because they knew where we were. They're like, no, no thanks. No, we're good. Damn. It was Holy shit, that is insane. A, it was an extremely nerve-wracking and anxious evening. Like, we really we really thought we were going to have to physically have a fight, an altercation inside this fucking rest area. It was, it was literally like, Shmir was going around going, just grab the nearest thing you can grab if it goes down. 
And that's that's really how it is far as it got. Fortunately, it did not get to that point. We have, um, thankfully, our tour manager um, lived in Belgium, and he was able to speak Belgian to some of these, oh, these okay. folks and kind of quell the situation slowly but surely. We got cabs and and started getting the tour party out of there and down to a hotel of maybe like five miles down the road. But then we were all in speculation of what starts happening when we start fragmenting off. Are they going to follow the cabs right. to the hotel? Are we gonna have shit there? Are they gonna be waiting tomorrow? Are once half the people leave here, are the rest of these dudes gonna go inside over here? So it was just, it was really fucked up. I mean, we put some video up up, up of it on Facebook that the next day too. But uh, that's probably that's definitely Holy probably shit. my shittiest. That's probably my shittiest moment on tour, because I I literally I literally had a few times where I thought to myself, I'm I don't know if I'm going home. I don't know. Wow. This, this might be where it ends. That is insane. I, I was sitting there going, are you Damn. fucking kidding me? It's going to fucking end here? This is how it's going to end? Like, are you fucking kidding me? And what's, what's, really, funny, what's really funny about it is, um, is my friend Sophie, who's our, our Overkill's merch girl, she was on that tour with us because she was doing merch for Destruction and Flotsam on that tour. So it's funny every time I bring that up, if I ever say that on the bus and and... And, you know, she's there, too. I'm like, yeah, well, that's Sophie. She was fucking with us, you know. She knows, you know. It's like, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was crazy. Just, Damn, uh, that is yeah. absolutely insane. I, I was going to say, you know, the, the night after might have been, you know, the fastest and most energetic you've ever played after an experience like that. But maybe it was uh, just hoping that you're going to fucking get out of there. <laughs> and, uh, but, but, you, know what, you know what's even more fucked up about it is that, that, was, that happened the second to last night of the tour. Second to last night of the oh, tour. Oh, wow. So the next day we were going to Mannheim, Germany. By the time we got out of that hotel, <laughs> the bus company had to send two buses up to us to replace the bus that we were on. And they sent these two fucking – dude, they sent us – the bus that flossomed that – they sent up like a fleet of buses to get us out of there, finally, like the bus company the next mm. day, and get us to the last show. At that point, we had our own bus. Flotsam had our own bus. And it was like, what is this, the bus that Keith Richards and Mick Jagger get when they're fucking stoned here? Because it was like, <laughs> it was pristine, like a full bathroom shower and stuff in it. And do you know how defeating that is to step in a bus like that with all this class on the last day of the fucking tour? <laughs> when, you've been, when you've been sitting in a bus with two other fucking bands for four and a half weeks, just listening to them party all fucking night while you're upstairs trying to sleep. Because you got to remember, Flotsam, we're in our 50s. We don't party all night after shows anymore. We did that for years. We go yeah. to bed when we're done. It's like the old yeah. guys go to sleep. The young guys stay downstairs. And every night we just wake up going, Jesus Christ, are they oh. still fucking up? Like, <laughs> so, so it was, it was bittersweet to get this, this giant bus with condo bunks, me and Steve are sitting there one night just laying in the bunks going, this is just not fair that we have to get back in a van now for five fucking days. Because even though <laughs> even though the destruction tour was over, we were doing five shows in Scandinavia, in Scandinavia after the tour was over because we got this chance. Oh, okay. We got a chance to do, <laughs> and it's funny because <laughs> I said six weeks in Europe, but that's exactly what this tour turned into. We turned it to six weeks in Europe. Because it was five weeks of destruction, oh, no. then we tacked another week on it. Because what happened was I got a chance to do a drum festival. This is actually very strange. This is uh, actually very odd the way this whole thing kind of panned out. I get called to do a drum festival in Poland. Um, and it's like a week after this destruction tour ends. And I go, well, you know, it's, that's pretty close to when, when uh, I'm going to be ending a tour you know, is there any way maybe we can try to get some show? You know, how much is the, first of all, how much are you offering me for the clinic? The clinic price was really good. It was worth it for me to, to try to find a way to make, to, to stay there and, and do that. So in the interim, this is, this is like months before we went on this tour. Cause I had like probably an eight month notice of knowing about this drum festival. So also who was supposed to be on the drum festival along with us was going to be home with Nick Menza. Sadly, oh, in, wow. in the time that it took from the booking of this festival, Nick died. So 
when Nick died, you know, like a month later, kind of the light bulb went off in my head. I went, that means that Ohm's not playing, obviously, because there's no drummer. What are they going to do about the music? So I, I hit up the promoter and I go, hey, uh, what do you think about if I can get Flotsam to, to do, would you want Flotsam to do the show in, instead of Ohm? And they're like, can, can you get them to do that? I'm like, if we can find some shows to, to fit in between ending the tour and, and doing this festival, yeah. And that's what we did. So we ended Destruction like on a Sunday. We went to Scandinavia for like four days, and then we went down to Poland and did that show. And then I stayed and did two, two drum clinics or two festival, played for two festival drum festival days after that. But Damn. it was wow. like, that's what it was. It was like, it was coming off that, that night of hell. And then we get the super bus, and now we got to get back in a van for five days and drive through Scandinavia freezing our ass off. <laughs> <laughs> we're like, was it really worth it for another week? I'm like, yeah, it was worth it once we yeah. got the money at the end of the show. Yes, it was worth it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Dear God. Uh, I, now, I, I, I have to say, I do have a couple more questions, but I'm just noticing we're well over an hour. Are you okay as far as having a, having a couple of more, or did you need to wrap? Because I don't want to keep you – a lot longer right. than what uh, you know what what you got. Okay, all right. All I, right. I just wanted to make that all a mention because right. I just looked and I'm like, holy fuck. Um, all right, I, I, I love to. So before we, okay, sweet. Um, you know, we're gonna dig into shadows fall and overkill. But what I wanted to, what I wanted to ask before, uh, you know, those two things, as far as you know, with over the years, you know, as far as your playing and time spent, you know, time uh, off of the road, you, you get into, you know, as far as working with, with students and doing drum lessons and different things. Can you tell us about influences from early on as far as maybe friends or even personal instructors that you've had that kind of have helped foundation how you, how you teach the drums and how you work with students? Yeah, I have a, I have a lot of teachers that I would, I would definitely lay, lay, lay claim to um, for stealing their teaching methods or, um, giving me great ideas that I've passed on to my students. Um, starts with all mm -hmm. my teachers, start, starting with all my teachers here. It really starts with my, my uh, middle school band instructor because he was, he was the guy that really started showing me things on the drums. And he was a saxophone player primarily, but he, you know, he was pretty proficient at the drum kit. And he was just a great guy. And he always let me used to, always let me just go and play drums in the, in the, Cushion room anytime I had a free period or whatnot, he just opened the door and let me go play. Um, okay. So he was probably the first one who was instrumental in making me think about learning what I was doing with the drums and making and making me um, pay attention to to my stickings and to uh, exactly what I was what I was into my reading. Okay, so that would fall fall through later with, with the way that I taught people. Um, but once I got in high school, I started. I studied with a guy whose name was Don Bush, and he was probably one of the most proficient teachers in this area. He was a New England Conservatory graduate, and uh, he just had amazing hands. Great jazz player, great big band player. Um, but he was the foundation for hands for me. Um, okay. Stick control, the Louis Belson book, um, syncopation. That's really where all that started with me, and then. Um, years later, I'd study with, with Larry Levine here, who is another great player who, who just made me think about things like linear patterns and things like that. Um, and then finally, the, my last teacher up here was Ted McKenzie, who I was t studying with his latest, his latest 2008, really. Um, oh, okay. Once, once again, working on, working on my hands and, 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 and how can I, um, how can I play smoother and, and, and things like that. And, and, working on those kind of techniques. And then, then my, my, you know, my Berkeley instructors, Arvin Scott was a great instructor that I had there. Skip Haddon was probably my favorite instructor that I had there. He's still someone that I still stay in contact with this day, uh, to this day. And he was, uh, he was just played, you know, I played in weather report for a while and he's just a great fusion drummer. And he was that guy that showed me how to do things like sambas and bossa novas and fusion drumming and that, type of that type of stuff that's you know in dynamics and things like that that's what oh, i learned with okay. him and that's anytime that i teach any kind of latin stuff or anything like that that's all taken just just from what i learned with skip um and and lastly a, a guy that's really heavily influential in the way i teach was rod morgenstein um because i i just took a lot of rod stuff that he did in for modern drummer 
and his books and, and, and things like that. And I've always used that stuff for my students. It's very, very, it's very educational. It's very easy to learn. It's very musical. And that's, that's what I like about it. So I've had really had a lot of great, <clears throat> great influences as far as it comes to, you know, the, the teaching platform. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Now you still do, you still do lessons virtually as far as like through Skype today, right? I do. I'm not teaching a lot lately. It doesn't seem, it seems like there's not much interest or people don't have a lot of money, which I think is a lot, a lot of it is. I just don't think that people have the money for it right now. I'm always yeah, out there right. and I'm, I'm, I'm always out there and accessible. It's just not too many people accessing. <laughs> yeah. But I still, you know, I still got, I still got, a, I got a handful every week, you know, so still keeps me busy. Okay. All right. Yeah, no, I mean, and that's, that's awesome too. That's one thing, you know, where it's one thing to have, you know, somebody who every once in a while you hear you have an instructor early on that you went to go and learn the guitar and they're trying to teach you classical things. And it's like shit that like, I don't want to play Mary had a little lamb. Like I want to play that Slayer song that I just listened yeah. to, you know, and, and, but yet, you know, as far as your instructors and, and different, you know, mentions, I mean, that's, that's nice. Or yourself being in a band. It's like, shit, I can learn from this guy. Like that's a fucking cool opportunity. Yeah, I've never, I've never been, I've never been one of those guys that went to. Uh, I always learned songs on my own uh, by listening to records and, and just sitting with the record. I never, I've never gone to an instructor and like, oh, can you show me how to play this? I, it's just like that's not what I'm. I don't want to sound conceited or anything, but I didn't really need. So I didn't need my teacher to show me how to play a song. I could sit there with the fucking record and listen figure it out <laughs> yeah i mean yeah. if there's a hard part sure like i might ask the teacher hey do you know what he's doing there but like i feel like that's a waste of money sort of it's like i'm not gonna I'm, and, and i feel like that with lessons too because there's people people like oh can you teach me how to play thoughts without words or some shadows fall song I'm like that's how you want to waste your money i'm like yeah i can but how about if i teach you about the techniques involved that, that i use to play this song like how about i show you how to play the double bass the the way I play it in this song. You just can't just mm -hmm. jump on the kit and do it. How about like, I teach you how to do that. No, you just want me to play. All right, I'll just play the song. That's easy money. <laughs> I mean, that's fucking easy money. Hey, show yeah. me how, show me, play something you've played 300 times. Okay, cool, man. No problem. <laughs> I'll just have it for the cows come home. But like, that's why I always yeah. like with my, with my lessons, I go to a drum lesson to, to learn something that I wasn't learning at home. You know, like I wasn't bringing mm -hmm. Rush songs in. I was going in to learn how to try to start playing, you know, jazz songs in stage band. But, you know, nice. everybody, okay. everybody does when, stuff differently. Sure. When, when playing in band, did you play drums? Was that initially what you signed up or was it something like there was another instrument and you were introduced to drums? No, I, I, when, I start, when I started playing drums in third grade, I went immediately into school band. Like I started, I started, oh, okay. I started taking lessons in third grade. We weren't allowed, we weren't, uh, thank you, Nathan Flores. Um, we were not allowed to go into school band, like really until sixth grade once you got to middle school. But as soon as I was in middle school, I was right in school band. Um, okay. So sixth grade, I was in just regular concert band. By seventh grade, I was now in concert band and jazz band, and I was in concert band, jazz band, sixth grade, seventh, or seventh grade, eighth grade. By the time I got to high school, my first year, I was in concert band and marching band. My second year, concert band and marching band until I broke my arm racing BMX and then I was out for the rest of the season as far as oh. as far as the bands because I missed marching season and I just didn't come back to band that year I'm like oh, I'm just gonna sit home and learn exit stage left <laughs> that's what I did <laughs> I, I don't I don't want to come to band after after school I want to go home and play Xanadu so I, I didn't go back to band <laughs> I didn't go back to band in 10th grade but 11th grade when I moved high schools and I went to Nisqyuna I then that's when I got fully involved in everything. So I was in I was in concert band, jazz band, and orchestra playing, you know, uh, mallet percussion and timpani. And I did that for eleventh oh, wow. and eleventh and twelfth grade because there was no marching band at Niskayuna. Thank God, because I I really I didn't want to do marching band again. Even though I'm glad I did for for my hand's sake, and I actually wished I paid more attention to it. But I am glad there wasn't a marching band eleventh grade. I'm like, all right, three's enough. Uh, so I did, all, I did all that until I left for, for Berkeley that the next year. Okay. Damn. And then, I mean, it, it, having that opportunity too, you know, I, I know that you've, 
mentioned in other interviews just as far as, you know, kind of feeling overwhelmed at first and not knowing what the fuck you were, you were doing there and then seeing, you know, somebody yeah. young that's along the sides and playing too. So, I mean, that, you know, that it's, it's an awesome story as far as hearing, you know, early on from just influences into, you know, a traditional, you know, uh, uh, studying of being in band and then, you know, even going further into college and then playing, you know, metal and, and, and really digging into some of the stuff too, and digging into, you know, some of the things with shadow fall that you've done and now, uh, you know, overkill and obviously super excited for this new album that you guys just recently, you just re you, re you got done tracking like for February, right? March, February. <laughs> I've been done a, a fucking year. <laughs> I started oh, talking shit. to okay. last. Yeah, well, Facebook was nice enough to give me a reminder letting me know on this day last year you were here. <laughs> oh, I was. Well, that's great because I don't even know what fucking year it is. Uh, yeah, apparently I started, I, I started the album last year. Uh, yeah, we're, okay. we're, everything's completed. It's just piece by piece everything's coming into Colin to start mixing. So I don't. I don't have a date right now. I think it's supposed to be March of next right. year, but I know everything is, is in for to start mixing. Um, I really can't. Sweet. Musically, I can tell you it's fucking awesome. I really don't know where we are vocally because I haven't really, I haven't heard much from, from Blitz as far as demo wise. Um, not to say it's not done. I just haven't heard anything. Uh, but he's, you know, he's yeah. been, okay. he's got some, some things going on. So I'm sure everything will, will be fine. But musically it's, uh, it's number twenty. It's the same old overkill you know and love. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of aggression on it. Um, I think it's definitely definitely nice. where where the wings wings of war was and and beyond. You know, still got a lot of a uh, lot of aggression and speed on there. But there's some really cool cool stuff on there too. There's a couple a couple songs that really kind of stand outside too. I think uh, musically because they're kind of slower and heavier. Oh, okay. kind of like a kind of like a horoscope or a skull crusher type type tune. Um, oh yeah, damn! So, okay, nice. Yeah, I'm pretty excited. Now, about it, it. is there anything drum wise as far as that you changed up a bit as far as even like sizes of drums or different things that you don't normally incorporate a different china, different cymbals at all? Was there anything that you brought into the the, the studio working on this album? Yeah, actually, on this on this album, I had actually added an eight inch tom because I I had only I was only using two rack toms before, like in the last record. I've been using two rack toms for the longest time, but I got I found a way to finally fit the the high tom in. So there was another just another voice. For, for this record and probably like another splash symbol, but that did come into play because there was a lot of times where I played the three toms with the three splashes as a fill. So there's a sex, there's something that's happening between those six surfaces. So there, there's a method to my madness. It's not like I'm just like throwing ah, some, some okay. throwing shit up there just to make my tech go. Really, dude, another symbol. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. shut up, and set it up. <laughs> God damn it! Not another drum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I didn't set the gong bass up for for the kit when we tracked. I just did all, you know, anything that I used the gong bass on, I just sampled the hits afterwards. It's just easier. Oh, okay. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Nice. Now, uh, another thing, too, as far as, you know, with, with Shadows Fall, you got this this show coming up here in, in a, well, December. Uh, what What can you tell us about as far as, re you know you kind of mentioned having to dig back into it and you know having to get back into the 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 phase of of, of playing that stuff and and some of the uh aches and pains that come along with it were there you know certain was there an album or certain songs that you kind of dove right into getting familiar with the stuff well no because i'm familiar with i'm i'm familiar with everything first of all because i'm like an elephant thank god and i really kind of retain songs after i've learned them especially ones okay. that i've written myself the that yeah. really, it really helps when you write and play them a million times yeah um, right that's true i should say re-familiarize I, I should, right but obviously the thing is, well, you also have to remember, <laughs> right right but what you all and i'm not trying to say that oh, once I, I learned a song and i'm perfect i'm going to play it with no mistakes but you have to remember i've been doing twitch for a year so all that material is fresh because I've been playing it on there. I've been doing Shadows Fall streams or request streams or whatever. So all of those songs, for the most part, it's not like the other guys who, oh, shit, I haven't touched this stuff in fucking 10 years. Me? I haven't touched this stuff in two months. I played that song last month. Oh, I played that one a month right. ago. Or I played, that, oh, I played that one last week. So I feel like I have a, a, a running start over everyone because – I was able to, to stay playing and have the material together. Now, I didn't know what we were going to play because, you know, 
what someone wants to hear on Twitch and what the band is going to agree to play live can be two totally different things. But once we started right. getting in the in the in the scheme of of rehearsing, it was let's pick. We went album by album. We're going we're going album by album with our rehearsing, and we're like, all right, let's pick songs off this record. They're still not going to guarantee that they're going to be in the set. But let's pick these songs and let's start working on these songs and let's see which ones we like hearing in the room. Let's see what we like playing. We're kind of like doing all this preliminary work and we're going to figure out what we like and then it's going to kind of be like, then we're going to make a master list and kind of send it to Brian, get his thoughts on it, and then keep, you know, keep honing our, the final master list. We don't want to just pick 15 songs and go, all right, these are the ones we're going to do because that's what we've done all the time. Right. We're just going to start playing a lot of music and figure out what we want to play. Just because we think we might want to play the first Noble Truth off of One Blood, once you know we get Brian's opinion on it, he might not want to play that song. He might want to play one of the other songs that we're playing off that record instead. So it's it's a lot of that. So right now we're just going through and picking through material uh, and putting it together slowly. I'd say we're Sweet. definitely... We're definitely way farther along, I think, than we thought we were going to be. Like, there hasn't been, oh, okay. there really hasn't been any, like, all right, stop, hold on a second. What the, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? There's been none of those moments so far. <laughs> it's been like, all right, well, you want to try uh, Inspiration on Demand? Ah, well, how's that one go? Uh, yeah, probably. Yeah, fuck it, just count it off. All right, well, if we can get to the end, <laughs> that's cool. And there hasn't been so far, knock on wood, there hasn't been any time that we haven't got to the end so far. Like someone oh, may okay. drop out or something or forget a part. But, oh, yeah. So oh, here we are, you know, or something like that. But, you know, it, it, it's back. So I'm not Sweet. really worried about yeah, it. A, I'm, I, we're, uh, we're really we're kind of we're really I think we're still kind of uh, ahead of the game because the show isn't for another <laughs> fucking two months still. So two or three months, really. Sure. Three months. So. We have plenty of time, but things yeah, are it's... things are off to a raging start, and uh, and really the way I'm leaving it is that uh, Shadows Fall is practicing. We're gonna play a show, and no, you you no, we're not gonna tell you what songs we're playing, and no, we don't care which ones you want to hear. That's probably just my attitude, but I think I mean we do care, but it's like. It really is like we're putting a lot of work in this. We want to enjoy this too. Like we know we have yeah, the two yeah. we have the two lists set mats. The ones we know we yep. need to play, the ones we kind of want to play ourselves. And like let's see if we can marry these two lists together where we don't have 25 fucking songs in the set list cuz you know there's a limitation to what we're going to do. <laughs> yeah, totally. And and I think that I think you know that's completely appropriate just with the fact of that's a lot of the, you know, it takes away a lot of the, the mystery of going to a show or, you know, like you have a band that hasn't played in X amount of time and you didn't get to go. And then in five seconds, it's on YouTube. You know, it's like, fuck, man. I mean, right. it, it's it, it kind of takes away a little bit of that excitement of, you know, hearing about, you know, corn in the 90s going on tour and they had a fucking huge cage in the backdrop, you know, and it's like, what? I can't wait to see that shit. You know, now it's like, well, I can just pull it up online and see it. And, right. Exactly. Ah, I might go. I might not. <laughs> and, if everybody, and everybody keeps telling us that we are, you guys got to stream this. You guys got to stream this or film it. We're not. We're not. If you don't come, that. you're not going to see it. You know, you know how yeah. you're going to see it. You'll see it by everybody who puts their clips up on YouTube the next day or whatever. But mm -hmm. we're, we're not streaming it. We're not taping it. It was discussed, but it just wasn't. It wasn't fully agreed upon. Um, there no, were just, I, I think that's cool. Yeah. You know, we just don't, we, what it came down to, the bottom line was we didn't want to fucking stream our first show back because what if it's not fucking great? What if it sucks? Even though it's not gonna, we, we know in our yeah. hearts, like, <laughs> I even said this in practice, I go, guys, did we ever walk in the dressing room on the fucking 15 years that we played shows and went, wow, we really suck tonight. No, we never did. <laughs> so how was that going to happen on December 18th? But the shadows right. of the black cloud will find a way to finally, to finally come <laughs> and land over the Palladium that night. And so, so my point is, I do, I do understand the, the side of maybe let's not put it out for everybody to see tonight. And I do understand the fact that, well, let's maybe we should take this for prosperity's sake or whatnot. But you know what? I just want to play the show. 
show and let it be that. That's why we said everybody's like, well, how many shows are you booking after? None. This is it. If you want to see the band, you better get a ticket and come to Massachusetts on December 18th. And I got, I got some bad news for you right now. General mission tickets are sold the fuck out. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> that's insane. You I mean, know. awesome. It's it, I should say insane in, in, in the best way possible. I mean, you know, for sure seeing and, and how fast too. I mean, like that shit is well gone. So <laughs> are there other, other options as far as like VIP packages or something like that? that are yeah, there's, sale? I think there's I like, see. I think there's, there's a VIP package that's still on sale. And I think there's maybe like 18 to 25 of those left. There was only 200 of those left. Shit. So what, what I know is left is like, there's some, some VIP packages and then some VIP seating is still left available. I think in the balcony or something, but all the wow. general, I know all the general mission stuff is sold out. And, another, and, a, and another amazing thing about that, and even though it's got nothing to do with our genre musically, and thank God we're a band that fucking is doing a reunion show and hasn't played together in seven years, and that's why we're sold in the Palladium out, but Evanescence and, and uh, Hailstorm are right next door the same night at the DCU Center in Worcester. So, Oh, no shit. That, yeah, and that, that's a big deal, and there's still going to be a lot of people going to that show. And that got announced maybe two weeks after our show was announced. And we were like, oh, are you fucking kidding me? That yeah. night? And I just kept telling people, I'm like, guys, it's not going to impact our show, man. It's Evanescence and fucking Hailstorm. <laughs> Let me say it again. It's Evanescence and Hailstorm. Nothing against those bands. Chicks don't go to see Shadows Fall. <laughs> oh, unless they're dragged there with their boyfriend. So not going to affect our show. Now, if it rolled in and it said, oh, by the way, tomorrow night is Slipknot and Lamb of God at the DCU Center, I'd go, oh, shit, we're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, you're kidding me. Uh, Can we combine our Lord. shows, please? <laughs> well, that, that's, think, that's awesome. If anything, I think Hailstorm and Evanescence should be pretty concerned that our show is sold out. <laughs> yeah, touche, touche. I mean, that, that's touché. awesome. I'm, I'm glad, you know, I, I was I was glad to, to to see and to hear that too, you know, just as far as, I mean, because you guys, I mean, I've been a fan for, you know, years and years and obviously at the, the last album being 2012, you know, it's, it, it's, it's cool and it's still awesome to, you know, still listen to that stuff and the power of I and I and fucking a public execution. They, they still, pl plenty of that music still gets, uh, still gets played today too, sure. so. Yeah, they're, love them. They're love fucking them. bangers for sure. They're still hard to play too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, All right, man. Look. Oh well, it's me. Maybe it's not going to be that hard. If I like, sat down and played a light that blind, that's still fucking hard. God damn it! <laughs> yeah. Like right, those look, days where I actually get done practicing and going, that, well, shit, that dude's actually pretty good. Like, who was that guy? I was just trying to play. Like, God damn, that's my <laughs> shit. <laughs> oh, why did I have to show off so much of that song when I was recording that part or whatever? <laughs> Could have cut uh, that out, man. That but no, it's been, it's funny. been fun. It's been fun. It's awesome. Yeah. Look, man, this is. I'm gonna leave you. I'm gonna leave you there. I have one last fun, really quick finale question here. Uh, yeah, I want to ask as far as bringing it back to Overkill. Overkill releases the new album. Let me ask you hypothetically: if they gave you the opportunity, see, in our in our you know communications, you mentioned having a phantasm tattoo. All right, so with this new Overkill album, if they, uh, they gave you the opportunity, they said, look, Jason. Right there. Ah, holy shit, that's awesome. Damn. That, oh, was, from, that was from Paul, right? Yep. Nice. I love that. I love that. Yep. All right. So they give the opportunity. They say, Jason, look, we, we want to, to record this. We want to film this video at a, at a location from any horror movie ever. We're going to have this video on location or themed behind a horror movie. What, what, what would you choose as far as for this, this, this breakthrough overkill music video? What would you choose for the, uh, oh, that's, that's for the awesome. location? Yeah, I'm going to pick two. Uh, it's, it's, that's a, it really, it's really going to be an easy one because you can't – I can't be as generic and go, the boiler room with Freddy Krueger because Doc had already did <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that'd that'd be sick, though. That. Shit. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's, there's a couple, okay? There, yeah. If you want to be campy, we do it on the set of Camp Crystal Lake and I dress up as Jason. But that'd be stupid because that's just a joke. <laughs> um, but seriously, seriously though, um, I would say either 
somewhere phantasm related. So either in the mausoleum or somewhere in the cemetery, or I'm going to pick the two, the two horror movies that scared the shit out of me. The most shit out of me when I was the youngest, the, the two, let me try that again. The two films that scared the shit out of me at the youngest age. First was phantasm. The second one was Salem's lot. So oh, that's going to yeah. be, that's the second, the second setting is, I don't know, pick any cemetery and cemetery shot from Salem's lot. That Nosferatu vampire guy used to just, that, that one scene where he just shows up in, in, in the screen just scared the shit out of me when I was a kid. <laughs> so either one of those settings would be fine. Man, that's awesome. I, I absolutely love that. And and God, if, if anyone's listening that is willing to make that happen, Jesus, uh, I completely back that. That would be fucking awesome. <laughs> or how about this? And if we wanted to go, or if we wanted to go obscure horror movie or B movie movie horror, because I like a lot of <laughs> I like a lot of can't be shitty horror movies. So let's go B horror movie. If you could somehow shrink us all down and put us inside Belial's basket. From Basket Case? Oh, remember, my remember God. Basket one? Case. Yes. <laughs> Fucking or, A. Or have you ever seen Maniac with Joe Spinell? Dude. Disgusting. I love, I, I mean, I love and hate that movie. <laughs> his apartment. How about his apartment for a music video? Oh. With, like, the masks on the shit. wall and shit. <sighs> You, YouTube would be ban- his, banning that his, for sure. His, bre- his, his breathing. <laughs> Dear God. Oh, my Lord. That, that, I mean, those are all awesome selections. Those, that's that's, that's, uh, that's, that's Every- good stuff. And the basket case one, I, I like that. that. That's something different, too. Shit. Well, you know, I, <laughs> that's an easy one because it just goes back to what was his name? Belial. So that's a, you know, yeah. a Shadows Fall thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. That fucking rules. Look, man, I've had you well over the time that I requested. I greatly appreciate this. Thank you so much for the time. No uh, problem. You know, and, fun. and Thank you. I might have to have you back on to you know talk some horror movies. You know, and dig a little bit Absolutely. further. Absolutely, we that, didn't even really uh, get to that, but that's all right. Yeah, that's all right. yeah. Well, you know, I, I appreciate the time <laughs> for uh, for today, man. You take care and no uh, stay healthy, stay safe. Absolutely, you too. We'll talk soon. All right, Be man. Well. See ya. Take care. He's a lo-fi horror guy. Yeah, he's kind of a guy, but he is so lo-fi, lo-fi a horror guy. Yeah, lo-fi horror guy has been recorded in front of a live studio audience.